Hello everyone, welcome to tutorial 9 and introduction to business informatics course. I hope you're still holding up and you're still interested to proceed with uh, the online material and uh, with the major in general. So uh, today's topic is actually interesting and uh, easy because uh, it's part of uh, everyday's life. I'm quite sure many of you have experienced uh, what we're going to talk about today. Uh, however, it's important for us as business informatics students or for business students in general to understand how internet and technology changed the game of traditional business. And it allowed people to exchange services and products over the internet without having to be physically present in the stores. So uh, this kind of action is known as e-commerce or electronic commerce. And as we always do in the tutorials, I would like to tell you uh, when will you take this topic in more details throughout your undergraduate studies in the GUC. Uh, so you basically are going to take, uh, uh, if you continued in the major, inshallah, <laughs> you're going to take um, an, a course in semester four. Uh, that's called e-business and government and subjected to be changed to be a uh, digital transformation course which is uh, basically um, concerned with uh, the same topic of electronic commerce and so on and how to transform the uh, traditional businesses to be available online or on digital platforms and the other course that you're going to take uh, in business informatics major that is relevant to e-commerce is uh, e-business development that is subjected to be digital marketing at the end of the day whether you're going to take um, the courses as they are right now or as uh, the way they are subjected to change uh, either way, you're going to dig deeper into e-commerce and know more about it. But for today, let's cover the basic concepts that we need to know before proceeding with um, the course or the major in general. So let's start. So according to what I said, uh, we're going to follow this class agenda throughout this tutorial or more or less follow this agenda. So uh, we're going to start first by discussing some key concepts in e-commerce that you need to know before we proceed with uh, any other thing in the tutorial. And then afterwards, we're going to classify uh, the e-commerce business models according to different characteristics or um, criteria um, to know what's the difference between the electronic commerce. Um, and then we're going to watch a video for Amazon uh, and like learn how they make money or generate uh, revenues and the story behind uh, this massive success. And last but not least, I'm going to give you a project hint um, about the project that you're going to implement this semester according to the instructions that were sent to you earlier um, so that you can be prepared for what kind of questions you can be expecting about um, this lecture and tutorial. Um, so let's start. Okay, so let's first start by um, mentioning again what does e-commerce means. As we mentioned in the introduction, it simply means uh, the exchange of products and services over the internet between individuals or organizations. So it's simply any transaction that might happen over the internet. 
and any normal business or traditional business that is enabled by the internet or performs some kind of transaction or process over the internet to enable its operations will be known as e-business. An example of very, very well-known e-businesses or e-commerces that we witness every day in our life is uh, Fauri, Outlook, Eventus, uh, Amazon for sure, and uh, Netflix is actually uh, an e-business. So uh, we have many, many e-businesses uh, available in the internet and uh, it's actually taking over um, the whole world because even the traditional stores uh, that used to sell clothes for example now they are having uh, their own online website that you can start uh, searching and looking for uh, whatever you want order it and then they can deliver it to you so uh, most of the traditional businesses started uh, to be digitally enabled by the internet and to be transformed into an e-business. Okay, now as we agreed what this e-commerce and e-business means, we need to go through some key concepts in order to be able to proceed with this tutorial. So the first concept that we will discuss in this tutorial is digital markets and as expressive as the term might sound it's actually normal markets but they are enabled by the internet to allow instant information and transaction exchange between people over a digital network which actually changed the way traditional businesses operates and by traditional business i mean the stores that only presents physically and the stores that only presents physically are known as brick and mortar while if the business has physical and online presence at the same time it's called click and mortar and if the business does not actually exist physically just like the case of amazon or jumia it's called pure play or virtual play. The second concept that we need to discuss is the digital goods. Digital goods are simply products that can be delivered or sold over a digital network or the internet, such as music tracks, videos, softwares, newspapers, and books. Traditionally, these kinds of products, they were actually sold in a physical form. For example, the music tracks used to be on a cassette or um, a CD or even um, an 8-track. And the videos used to be on DVDs and stuff like that. And the newspaper used to be um, actually printed and we used to go and buy these newspaper uh, from uh, the people who are selling them. And finally, the books. Apart from people preferring sometimes to read um, the physical books and or the physical newspaper, there is no doubt that the internet and the technology in general generated new forms of products just like the ebooks or the electronic newspaper or now that you can just listen to music tracks on whatever device that you have without having to actually carry the cd or the cassette with you so again that's a form of the creation of new goods and services through information technology. ICTs or information and communication technologies did not only help in creating new markets and new products and services, 
but it also helped in creating new business models. And we will actually see in a while an interesting video that shows an innovative business models that were enabled by technology. But first, let us define what does a business model means. Because even if you know the word or you have um, seen it somewhere before this course, you might not have thought what this actually a business model means in a definition. So a business model is simply a detailed plan that describes how a company makes revenues. So what does this mean? A business model simply explains what kind of products and services are you willing to provide in your business and what kind of value does this product or service bring, bring to the community or the society in general or the community of businesses and what are the required resources that you need in order to be able to deliver or make this product to available to the customer and what are your partners what are your costs and so on so that's simply what does a business model means so let's move on. So as we said, a business model is a detailed plan of a company to generate revenues. So basically, a detailed plan will contain many, many details. And we need to actually be able to summarize what does a business do in a readable format that everyone can understand whether they are partners, whether they are um, like a community of business people, or even if you're um, trying to ask for investments and funds and so on. So you need to actually summarize your business model in an understandable and readable format. So the thing that helps us create a simplified business models is actually the business model canvas. So let's see the components of the business model canvas and what can we found, find inside. Okay, we can actually find inside the business model canvas the building blocks or the main components of any business model in the world. These building blocks can actually be the value proposition or what kind of value are you actually adding to the customer, which is reflected in the product or the service that you're going to provide. And what kind of resources are you going to need in order to help you deliver this value? Then what kind of activities are you going to perform in order to be able to achieve this value? Who are your key partners that will help you deliver this kind of product or service? And what is the costs associated to delivering this product or services? On the other hand, we should actually highlight who are our target customers and the customer segments that we're aiming to deliver the product or the service to and how are we going to establish and manage the customer relationships and what are the channels that we are going to use in order to be able to reach this customer segment and last but not least which is the most important thing how are we going to generate revenue throughout the product or the service that we created so overall, this is what does a business model canvas include. Just like any business in the world, e-commerce or e-businesses as well can have business models. I've chosen this example to show you an e-commerce business model from the internet made, made by someone 
So it doesn't really have to be accurate, but it pretty much reflects the information that we need to acquire through this tutorial. So the business model canvas was designed for Netflix. Uh, I don't have to waste time explaining what is Netflix because um, I think every one of you already knows um, uh, the platform <laughs> by now. So I don't have to go through this, but um, so basically the business model canvas reflects uh, the key activities or the, the building blocks of Netflix. So let's start by what value does Netflix bring to the community or the people in general? First of all, they provide on-demand anywhere video and they actually provide original content created by Netflix. So what are the key activities that they need to do in order to be able to provide this value? So they need to buy content and they need to optimize their platform consistently. And the resources that they are going to need in order to do this is um, a net or a neutrality or a bandwidth. They need a license agreement and they need a rating algorithm. And I'll tell you what is the rating algorithm later. Uh, it's actually something that's related to data mining and it's the thing that's responsible for um, recommending um, movies or series based on what you watched. But let's discuss this later. Um, so anyway, and the costs associated with this platform are mainly the platform costs, the content creation and the economies of scale. Um, and the key partners are movies and TV studios and so on. So they are mainly targeting uh, the mass market consumers and they are reaching them through app stores, websites, affiliate partners and so on. Finally, they are generating revenues through subscription. And later on in this tutorial, we're going to discuss different models of generating revenue streams. One of them is actually the subscription. So let's move on and see how others innovated and created new business models. Why is Amazon such a successful company? How come Tinder disrupted the overcrowded online dating market? And how did Spotify manage to make people pay for music again? Well, let me give you some quick answers here in the promo video, so you understand what this course is all about. Since the beginning, Amazon based its whole innovation strategy on constantly disrupting the sales and delivery channels, which are just one part of a business model of a company. They started by disrupting channels for the books market. Instead of going to a library to buy and pick up your physical books, you would order them online and get them delivered by post directly to your home. That was channel innovation and Amazon kept doing this ever since by selling more and more products online. When they created the Kindle, it became yet a new sales and delivery channel for books. You can both buy and receive books on your Kindle. And now Amazon is experimenting with drone delivery, which is yet another delivery channel. And they also introduced the Echo device with Alexa and the Dash buttons, which are both new sales channels. So instead of going on Amazon.com to order something, you can now tell Alexa to do it or press your Dash button. So both these devices are innovative sales channels. As you can see, Amazon is mainly innovating in one single area of the business model, which is the sales and delivery channels. Spotify is doing the same, but in another area of the business model, which is the revenue models. If we go back to the CD era, you needed to pay a big sum of money for a whole album, even if you only liked a few songs on it. Then Apple came with iTunes and disrupted this market by allowing people to pay for each song individually. That was the first massive revenue model innovation in the music industry. But illegal downloading was still a big problem and music revenues were going down. 
Eventually, Spotify came and proposed a streaming model where you could listen to music for free but with advertising, and the ad revenue was distributed among artists. So this was once again a revenue model innovation for the music industry. More and more people downloaded the app, but still, it didn't make enough money for the artists. That's why Spotify later introduced a paid version of its app, without advertising and with better features. So the whole revenue model became what we call a freemium one. That's when you have both free and paying users. And Spotify managed to reach a stunning 25% conversion rate. It seems that finally, the music industry has reached the right pricing and revenue model. So the success of Spotify is largely based on its disruptive revenue model in the music industry. And once again, this is just one block of their business model. And finally, Tinder dramatically disrupted the overcrowded online dating industry by innovating on design. Yes, just the design of their Okay, so as we are going through the key concepts, we have highlighted that the information and communication technologies or ICTs had an important role in developing and creating new markets, new products and services, and most importantly, new innovative business models. Just like Netflix, uh, Spotify and Amazon as we have seen a while ago. However, these are not the only business model existing in e-commerce and there are many many types of business models or countless combinations that can even exist at the same time um, in the same business in practice. So in general, it is impossible to have one standard classification of e-commerce business model or business models in general. Why? Because business models are viewed from different perspectives. For example, I might want to classify them based on how a company generates revenue. I might want to classify them based on who are the partners involved in each transaction over the internet. And I might want to classify them based on the product or service they deliver. So it's actually a matter of perspective. However, in this tutorial, we're going to cover different perspectives about classifying the e-commerce business models by finding the common characteristics between them. So let's start. So the first type of classification that we are going to have is the classification based on who are the parties or the people involved in making the business transaction. So 
this makes us end up with different types of e-commerce, such as the B2C, the B2B, and the C2C, which basically stands for business to customer, business to business, and consumer to consumer. We will go through each one of them and have examples on very well known uh, e-businesses that are adopting um, these kind of classifications. Okay, so the first type of e-commerce is the business to consumer, which is B2C. The B2C simply from the name it means that the transaction over the internet is happening between the business and the customer directly. An example of this is Amazon. But do not confuse Amazon because Amazon have different types as sometimes they are just like creating their own products just like the Kindle for example and selling it directly to the customer. So by this way Amazon is creating the transaction directly with the customer. However, if Amazon is like just selling the product of someone else and something like this, the case will be different. So for now, Amazon is considered uh, a business to consumer company because you can actually buy something directly from Amazon and proceed with the transaction. Spotify as well. If you actually want to subscribe to Spotify, you're directly doing the transaction with the business. And Apple. Apple, despite being physically present in some countries, they also have their online website where they sell their products and services, which means that this company is click and mortal because it both exists physically and online. Anyway, Apple is considered business to consumer company because they directly sell their products and services to consumer over the internet and the transaction is made between the business and the customer. Finally, and likewise, Netflix. If you want to subscribe to Netflix, you're directly doing the transaction of payment and subscribing uh, with the business. So that is the examples of B2C or business to consumer type of e-commerce. Moving on to the second type of e-commerce is the business to business type of e-commerce. And the parties involved are two businesses. So the transaction taking place is going to take place between two businesses. And this usually happens when there is a supplier to a business and uh, or a consultancy agency to another business and so on. However, a very well known examples of B2B or business to business e-commerce are SAP, the software providers, and we have mentioned earlier that they provide um, enterprise systems for other companies to help them operate. So SAP is doing the transaction with another business. Same goes for HP, for example. So imagine that the university wants to buy the computer labs for um, all the rooms uh, or for all the buildings. So we will just go to the company HP and ask them to provide us with the hardware required for the lab, such as uh, the keyboards, mouses, and so on. The transaction made in this case is a B2B transaction because it's made between a university, which is an entity or a business entity, not an individual or a customer, and the HP company. Same goes for Oracle and IBM. So simply B2B, the two parties involved are businesses, not individuals. Okay, 
So, the last type of e-commerce is simply the C2C or the consumer-to-consumer -consumer type of e-commerce. An example of this is PayPal. PayPal allows different customers to make transactions with each other. So, for example, if I want to, by the way, if anyone didn't hear about uh, PayPal before, it's a payment gateway. So, it makes people able to send money to each other. So, if, for example, I want to send money to my brother, I will use PayPal, and in that case, me and my brother are considered consumers, and the transaction is made between the two consumers, which is me and my brother. Same goes for OLX. OLX simply makes others sell their products or used uh, stuff or even uh, advertise for their, uh, their uh, apartments for rentals or sale. Uh, for other customers. So simply, there is a customer who wants to sell a certain product or a service uh, and then this customer starts using the website to reach other customers. But at the end, the transaction is happening between the two customers, not between the business and customer. OLX or the business is just acting as an intermediary between the two customers. And according to the book and the lectures chapter, the main categories or classification of e-commerce business models can be viewed from the perspective of value proposition. So it's basically what the website is doing. We have different business model categories in this table with their description and an example or two on these kind of business models categories. So, the first business model category is, or classification, are the portals. So, the portals are simply a gateway to the internet for sharing news, email, instant messaging, maps, calendars, etc. So, an example of this is the Yahoo Mail. I'm not sure if you witnessed um, the Yahoo Mail or not, but back in the days where Yahoo was extremely like one of the most famous chatting or instant messaging tools used, and its portal also provided um, information such as uh, recent news, uh, the uh, weather forecasts, and so on. So anything that acts like that is called the portal. So that's why actually Google is considered a portal. The second business model category is the e-tailer. E-tailers are simply online retail stores and they come in different forms ranging from Amazon that's generating huge amount of revenues from its e-commerce or e-tailer uh, website to the small local stores that might just uh, develop a website to display their products. So both of them are considered e-tailers. And not just Amazon, like uh, for example, uh, H&M, if they created a website to sell their products and so on, they are going to be considered e-tailers. The third category or classification are content providers. And content providers or this kind of business models are the kind of businesses that wants to distribute content such as music, videos, uh, movies, and so on. So, as obvious as it sounds, um, an example of this might be Watch It and Raimi, um, Spotify, uh, Netflix, and so on. So, all of these are content providers. The third category is simply the transaction brokers and transaction brokers are simply um, 
websites or brokers between two customers that allow processing the transaction um, in a better way. So normally, if these websites did not exist, you would be handling the transaction in person or going to a store, for example, and so on. And the main value proposition or the main value that this kind of businesses add to the customer is that it saves money and time, for example, in the travel booking services. If you want to book a flight ticket, you earlier you had to go to the office and like um, spend money on Uber and time. And then you go to the office and start booking the ticket. But now you can just do it online. Um, we have an Egyptian company actually or a business that acts as a transaction broker which is Fauri. If you downloaded the Fauri application you will be able to like uh, proce process many transactions um, without going in person or having to waste money and time. So moving on to the fifth category or classification of business models, which are the market creators. The market creators literally create markets, but not traditional markets. They create digital markets so that the buyers and sellers can meet and see the products and um, compare the prices and so on. An example of this is Jumia. Jumia is like taking from many, many stores all around Egypt and it's letting these stores display their products so that people can see the products advert uh, the products displayed uh, from all around Egypt without having to go to all the stores and then they can compare the prices, order and then receive whatever they ordered. The same thing goes for eBay. So the idea of market creators is simply creating a platform where the buyers and sellers will meet. Moving on to the service providers, they are simply um, an e-commerce business model that focuses on providing the web to applications such as um, uh, video sharing, uh, um, photo sharing, and even online data storage and backup and so on. So one good example of this is the Google applications. Google offers like Google Slides, Google Documents, and Google Sheets, etc. It also offers the Google Drive in which you can store the data and your whatever backups that you have inside this kind of drive. So Google is actually considered a service provider in the business model categories. And as we mentioned earlier, we said that you can actually find different business models applied at the same time in real life. And as you can notice, Google is mentioned twice. So it's considered a portal and a service provider as well. So that's totally normal. Last but not least, uh, the last category of business models of e-commerce is the community providers. Community providers simply provides or creates a community of people that has similar interests and they allow them to share their interests or whatever common perspectives that they have using media and information and so on. So this is the formal definition, but community providers are simply the social networking platforms such as Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, uh, LinkedIn, and so on. So all of these are considered community providers and they follow this business model category. Okay, the last way to classify e-commerce or e-businesses in this tutorial is according to the revenue models or in other words how these e-businesses are making money. There are different ways or different revenue models that company can make money through. 
So the first revenue model or way of making money is simply by taking fees for advertising. Just like the case of Anrani. So you're just listening to a song and in the middle of enjoying it, all of a sudden um, a very random advertisement pops up in your face because you simply didn't pay money and they want to still generate revenue from the users who are using the application for free. So they are actually adopting an advertising revenue model. Another way of generating revenues or making money is just by direct sales, just like the case of Amazon. So they are just selling their products, services, or information. And if you don't know that Amazon was providing services, wait for the video and you're going to know what kind of services. It's actually something that you're familiar with. So basically, Amazon is selling products, services, and information to generate revenue. And surprisingly enough, the services of Amazon is the greatest revenue generator for this company, not actually the products. And by products here, I mean the products that they are sell selling, just like the Kindle and so on. So that's for the direct sales uh, revenue models. The next revenue model is subscription, and it's pretty clear. You subscribe to get access to a certain service or content. And again, it's just like the case of Anrani. So if you really got bored uh, from uh, all the advertisements popping up in your face while listening to uh, the songs, you're going to actually pay uh, the fees for subscription um, to enjoy all the uh, download options and, uh, and the uh, full service and so on. Um, I've actually added the example of Anrani again, not because of uh, the lack of the examples, but because I just want to show you that uh, one company can be following more than one revenue model. Um, but in general, another example of uh, subscriptions will be uh, Netflix um, subscribing to uh, uh, a news uh, website and so on. Okay, we've said that Anremi is providing its service both for free users but with ads and it provides additional features but only for premium users such as the download, uh, the skipping of the song and so on. I'm quite sure you're familiar with Anremi. So uh, anyway, anything who offers a free product plus premium features just like Anagami is called a freemium revenue model. And if you remember from the video that we watched about Spotify, the guy was saying that Spotify created the freemium model and they innovated in the business model in the area of revenue models. So that's actually what this freemium means. Um, moving on to the other uh, revenue models, which are simply a transaction fee and affiliate, we will first start discussing uh, the transaction fee, which is uh, simply getting a fee for processing a certain transaction, just like the case of Fauri, for example. So if you want to go uh, pay for anything, you can just do it uh, through Fauri's application. And instead of going to the place, you just pay a very simple fee for or a micro payment for Fauri. So um, if you want to charge uh, your phone, for example, um, you can just uh, pay like five pounds and get the service and so on. So that's simply the transaction fees. As for the uh, affiliate revenue model, it's actually getting uh, a fee for referring um, of other businesses. So what does this mean? Imagine if Amazon is selling its um, reading device, which is the Kindle, uh, and they want to do advertisement for this uh, product. So they would start contacting another website that 
is concerned mainly with uh, reading devices or reading in general so that they can reach a um, bigger target audience or the specific target audience that they want. So they will contact this website, put the link of the Kindle product of the Amazon on their website and for each purchase that is made through their website or referral that is made through their website, they will actually pay a fees for the website. How is this calculated? You will actually know it in later courses because uh, some people choose to uh, pay uh, per click. So uh, if a customer just clicked on the advertisement, um, Amazon should pay. And some others prefer to pay when the whole um, purchase or transaction is made. So that's another model. But anyway, without going into details, you're going to take that uh, later in the e-business courses. Uh, that's how the affiliate uh, revenue model is working. Um, so uh, these are the six revenue models uh, that can be followed by the e-commerce or e-businesses. And uh, we are almost done by this tutorial. Uh, we still have like five minutes more. So uh, uh, we are going to watch the video. And uh, I hope you can relate all the concepts that's explained in the tutorial and lecture to this video and uh, start analyzing um, what kind of things that you can think of after the uh, video because um, it's going to give you a hint on how things are working on real life. Amazon reported record profits in 2018, earning $10.1 billion in net income compared to just $3 billion in 2017. Considering the company hardly had any annual profit until 2016, this represents major growth. Whether that's gap earnings, operating income, free cash flow, this company hit an inflection point at the beginning of 2018. It's one of the reasons that the stock materially outperformed the market. Traditionally, Amazon has funneled most of its money straight back into the company itself, leading to meager earnings compared to other tech giants like Apple or Google. But in spite of this strategy, Amazon has been making enough lately that there's still money left after all of its expenses on inventory, fulfillment centers, and people. Amazon still doesn't have the types of profits that other big tech companies do, say a Google or an Apple or a Microsoft, uh, but significantly more than they ever have in the past, and it really allows them to do much more experimentation with the core business. So what's changed? Though Amazon has long dominated the U.S. e-commerce market, online sales are not actually the biggest moneymaker for the company. Its e-commerce division isn't even profitable internationally. Instead, Amazon Web Services, or AWS, has generated the majority of the company's operating income since 2016. AWS is Amazon's cloud computing division, comprised of a huge network of servers providing processing and storage solutions for companies, government agencies, and individuals. What that did for Amazon is it turned Amazon into a technology company as well as being an e-commerce and, and retailer. Its clients, which include Netflix, Airbnb, and Yelp, are charged for their volume of usage, the features they subscribe to, and the services they use. AWS really started to grow about four or five years ago and became a significant force in computing. Amazon Web Services continues to get bigger as a percentage of overall revenue, and it's a highly profitable uh, business by Amazon standards, but by most corporate standards, it's doing something like 30% operating margins. In 2018, AWS brought in $7.3 billion in operating income and $25.7 billion in revenue, which, for reference, is more than both McDonald's and Macy's. In this last quarter, AWS was 58% of total operating profit for Amazon. So it's still clearly the profit driver for the overall company. In fact, in 2017, AWS was actually more than 100% of Amazon's operating profit. So without AWS, Amazon would not have been making any money. But though it's a huge reason behind Amazon's recent profitability, other areas of the company are seeing major growth as well. The fastest growing division of Amazon is its other category, comprised mainly of its advertising business. It grew 95% in the fourth quarter of 2018 and brought in $10.1 billion in revenue for the year overall. As Amazon has become the center of commerce for a lot of businesses, uh, it's become a huge advertising play as well. 
They don't break out the profits of this, but looking at comps like Facebook and Google, it's almost certainly also in that 30% operating margin range. If advertising continues to grow at this rate, some analysts even predict it will be more profitable than AWS by 2021. The last segment experiencing major growth is the third-party marketplace. While Amazon traditionally buys products in bulk from wholesalers and sells them at a slight markup, in the third-party marketplace, outside companies pay Amazon to sell their goods using its platform. Amazon takes about a 15 to 20 percent cut of the sales, while also collecting fees for things like storage and shipping. While Amazon generates significantly less revenue from third-party merchants than from products it sells, margins are much higher, making it more profitable than the traditional model. If you assume even a small 5% margin, you're talking about potentially $2 billion in profit just from third party contributing to overall Amazon. Today, more than half of all goods sold come from third party sellers, and more and more businesses are signing up. Sales of third party seller services rose 34% in 2018 to $42.7 billion. You really have to be on Amazon unless you are going to go it alone. Uh, Amazon is the, is the only place where you can instantly get scale uh, without having to do all of the marketing yourself. Amazon's smart speakers also have analysts excited. The last thing I find really interesting is Alexa. So you now have a, an installed base of over 100 million of these voice-activated devices. Over time, you'll find yourself increasingly turning to Alexa and say, Alexa, order more coffee. And it's one of those things that'll accelerate the move of Amazon in two places, the pantry and into the refrigerator. The boom in all these categories, from Alexa to cloud computing, advertising, and third-party seller divisions, raises the question of how the company should be valued. At the size of the company now, over two, well over $200 billion in annual revenue, it's just really hard to grow at 20 plus percent. So that means these investors who have expected high growth repeatedly every quarter are now looking at a company that with slowing growth but lots of profitability. There's clearly some consternation in the investor community as to how to value Amazon today. Okay, so uh, we're done. Um, I hope you enjoyed the video and thank you so much for reaching this point in the tutorial. Uh, the last thing that's missing in today's agenda is uh, giving you the hint about the uh, project that you might be doing in the next uh, few weeks. Um, so basically you're going to do uh, something that's comprehensive. Um, and you're going to basically have at least a question on each lecture. So one of the questions that you might be expecting regarding uh, this tutorial and lecture of e-commerce is that you can actually start thinking of um, how can you actually a new innovative uh, e-business idea that you can implement and think about the analysis that we made throughout the tutorial and the video and everything um, so that you can actually develop your own e-business idea. Uh, there are many many e-businesses um, or e-commerce uh, applications or websites uh, that was recently developed um, so you, in many different fields so you can actually start uh, thinking of your own. I think um, maybe some of you already uh, have an idea or had an internship somewhere, I'm not sure. But uh, anyway, this is actually what uh, you should be expecting regarding uh, this lecture and tutorial. Uh, thank you so much uh, and see you next week. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me on my email. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.